All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly JavaScript News. <laughs> I had to screw it up right from the beginning. This is BXJS Weekly JavaScript News Podcast, episode 51. Uh, we have a kind of a slow going week this time around. There is a usual amount of articles and news, but not that many releases and uh, not that many new libraries and demos, to be honest. So. I yeah, let's let's just see how that goes. Hey, Mehmetrix, welcome to the stream. Cheers, mates. So let's get started with the articles and news, shall we? We got some pretty cool things today. The first one we got here is ES5 or ES2015 to ES Next. Here's every feature added to JavaScript since 2015. This is indeed a very, very long article that is basically listing all the features that has been added to JavaScript starting from ES 2015 and on with a pretty relatively long examples and explanations of what the hell is going on. So if you are still confused about the some features of new JavaScript or new ECMAScript and maybe you just want to list all of them and know if you've learned everything or not, then this article is for you. If you already read something like exploring ES6 from uh, Dr. Axel Rauschmeier, or maybe you already know all the features, then you won't really find anything new here. Nonetheless, a very good summary of all new features and uh, some of the upcoming features. So quite recommended if you are not aware of them. My cats decided to have a fight. So if you um, hear hissing in the background, that is them. All right, continuing why I prefer objects over switch statements. Um, essentially an example on how you can convert the basic switch statement into the object property getters, which actually is a pretty nice pattern. You know, if you uh, switch over something and you only consider fixed values, as in, you know, you only check for specific word, for example, or for specific value in the uh, thing that you switch over with, then using objects is actually a way better approach for doing that because it's just cleaner, right? You, instead of doing a switch and instead of having a lot of lines of cases and everything, you can literally just do this, right? It looks very nice. Um, now this is a article that details the approach. The problem is that this only works when you um, have a very simple selector, right? When you can only select by value by, I don't know, true, false, string, whatever. As soon as you can, uh, as soon as you start needing a case when you have to switch dynamically, as in in each case you check something dynamically, this won't work, obviously. But nonetheless, if you never, if you weren't aware of this approach, do check it out. You, like there's even examples with uh, calling functions and defaulting to something and so on and so forth, which is quite nice. And it's a, yeah, it's a nice technique. Uh, hey, up here, welcome to the stream. All right, continuing, we got Festify and Preact for quick web app prototyping. Uh, this is essentially a tutorial on how to use Festify, Preact and HTM library uh, to really quickly set up and prototype your ideas, I guess, without using transpilers like Babel and having to, you know, compile JS6 to anything essentially. So it's very basic, very simple, but very efficient. Uh, Festify is essentially, if you never heard of it, Express.js, but uh, slightly different and smaller, faster. Uh, Preact is a React alternative that is again smaller and faster. And HTM is a library from the same author that allows you to write JSX without having to compile anything. The article itself is essentially a tutorial on how to combine all of those packages to make your own uh, basic REST API and basic UI. So if you are curious, do check it out. It's a very cool combo. And the fact that you can use HTM to essentially write JSX without um, having to, you know, set up any transpilation is kind of neat. So quite highly recommended. If you already used, well, some of those packages, you won't really find anything amazing and new in here. It's just a basic tutorial, but it is quite a good one. Next thing we got here is React Animation Libraries. This is a list, or I guess a collection of animation libraries that are, um, well, first of all, there's a list of general purpose animation libraries like JSAP, the GreenSock one, I think we covered it on the podcast a few episodes back. Uh, and I remember using this thing back in the days of Flash and ActionScript 3, which was actually one of the best animation libraries that you could have uh, for Flash as in, you know, when you needed to programmatically animate something. There's AnimeJS, which is also quite nice, and Pose, uh, which is also quite amazing. I've used, I think I've used Anime and Pose in two different projects and was quite successful. Both of them are really good. 
Both of them, by the way, have a React specific versions. Uh, now, the second part of the article talks about React specific library, a little React specific libraries is what I want to say. Specifically, stuff like React Motion, React Spring, which again we already talked about in this podcast, and React and just the React Transition Groups and React Anime, which is exactly the wrapper around AnimeJS. React Spring is indeed really good. I totally agree with that. I've tried it and the new versions with hooks were really, really cool. So if you are looking for physics-based animations, uh, React Spring is absolutely amazing. So the Spring, uh, Spring physics are really, really well implemented there and using it with hooks is just a joy. Nonetheless, if you are looking for alternatives, do check this article out. Uh, it does lists, I, I mean, I would say like most popular ones essentially, wouldn't say all because there's surely some more obscure libraries that are not listed here, but hey, you know, there's basically a good number of libraries to pick from. Hey, Bacow, welcome to the stream. Uh, you kind of made it. Yes, indeed, we are just getting started here. All right, so continuing, we got Progressive Web App Checklist 2019. A pretty nice checklist uh, that essentially talks about everything you have to account for when building progressive web app. Now, the good part is that it's not just talking about your typical things like, you know, hey, include a viewport tag or normalize stuff or make it responsive. Uh, it also talks about the caveats that you have, for example, on mobiles or in Safari or in a bunch of other things, because those things are typically what is the most annoying to deal with, right? Because you never know about them unless you specifically test on, for example, iOS devices. Safari is still the worst in terms of progressive web app support, at least on uh, iOS. I think the desktop one is kind of getting better over time, but yeah, working with progressive web apps on iOS is, is a bit of a pain. This article does a pretty good job of summarizing all the caveats and things that you have to think about. So if you are building progressive web app, make sure to check this one out. Next thing we got here is Next.js 8 Webpack Memory Improvements. This is a more detailed write-up uh, from the Next.js team. Uh, if you remember the last week, we talked about Next.js 8 release that uh, introduced uh, significant improvements to Webpack and Babel. Uh, I think, I'm not, I'm not sure if it was Babel actually, but to Webpack at least. Uh, because they've uh, started working on serverless Next.js feature that allows you to compile a specific route into one tiny serverless file that you can then deploy uh, into, for example, now shell, right? The now platform from Next guys. Now, the problem was they discovered um, is that sometimes when you build a project that has hundreds of pages, uh, the Next.js and Node builder would take up to um, 1.4 gigs of memory hip, which is insane, right? So that's a lot. And uh, it turns out that majority of this was due to some of the Webpack caveats. And uh, essentially this article talks about the what exactly they changed in Webpack and what was the cause and how they fixed it essentially. And everyone who you're using Webpack can now benefit of this because this was the pull request they made to the Webpack mainstream, which is honestly very impressive. So if you are curious about the details, do make sure to read this. It is a pretty interesting investigation. Next thing we got here is divide and conquer. Scale your Node.js app using distributed queues. Essentially a tutorial for working with distributed queues in Node.js, talking about a bunch of them, uh, you know, like RabbitMQ and other Redis-based queues and stuff like this, talking about how you can use them to split your uh, data processing, I guess, or any jobs related to your data into the smaller granular ones using uh, libraries like Q in this example uh, from uh, Automatic, which is quite nice. And uh, as I said, Redis-based. I personally have experience working with RabbitMQ, which almost always was quite good. I even wrote a tiny wrapper for it uh, called Microwork uh, for Node.js that allows you to do it in sort of promises and simple way. Uh, like, yeah, sometimes uh, queues can be extremely helpful. This article talks about essentially self-hosted queues like, uh, you know, Redis-based, RabbitMQ-based, and then goes into show how you can also use the queue as a service things like uh, Microsoft Azure. I don't remember what it's called, to be honest. And then there's the uh, SQS from Amazon, which is also quite nice. So if you are working with um, 
something that might benefit from cues, I guess, let me put it this way. I, it's just, I, I honestly don't know what kind of things you typically do on this because my experience with cues are limited to data processing. You know, when you have a large stream of data coming in constantly, it's typically a very good idea to split it into a small jobs that are then queued into one specific queue. And then you have the job handlers that do something to this data and reach it and then send it back to queue to save in the final database or data store or whatever. This is sort of my experience with it, but I'm, you know, I'm sure there's way more um, use cases for that. I just don't know about them. Nonetheless, this is a really good uh, introduction to queues and the types of queues that exists and sort of small code snippets that show you how to work on them on a very basic level. So if you're already familiar with queues, you won't really find anything new here. If you are looking to get into queues and uh, looking for an introduction, uh, there is basically intro for, well, majority of them, right? Do check it out. Next article we got here is TS Lint in 2019. A write up from Palantir team behind the TS Lint that talks about sort of convergence of uh, TS Lint and ES Lint as, you know, ES Lint sort of expanding their type checking capabilities, uh, I guess expanding its integration with TypeScript. And how will that affect uh, TS Lint and what the team will do and so on and so forth. So it looks like we're in the end is going to have one linter that is going to be doing everything, which is uh, something that I personally quite like. So if you are uh, curious about the future of TS Lint and what the team is doing, I guess that will be interesting to you if you're writing TypeScript. Do check this one out. If you are not in a TypeScript world and you are not using TS Lint, then well, that's probably of no interest to you. Next article we got here is. We migrated to Next.js to serve our homepage uh, and got 7.5x uh, faster. So yeah, this is another sort of use case description, I guess, for the Next.js. And um, it is insane what kind of performance you can get from it. So the guys migrated their basic React app to use Next.js. The article talks about what sort of uh, caveats were there and you know what things did they had to do? How tough was the move? What did they have to swap in? For example, you know, getting React Router out of the app and using Next Router for that and stuff like this. It is quite interesting. So if you're you if you're not using Next.js yet, be sure to check it out because yeah, the performance gains are absolutely insane because server side rendering is a pretty big thing for it. Um, if you're already using it, well, you won't really find anything new here. It's just your typical uh, comparison of Next.js to a plain React app. Uh, other than that, yeah, nothing really interesting there. Uh, hey, Dr. Pepper, welcome to the stream. All right, continuing, we got build your own radio streaming app with Howler.js. Uh, now, what this really says is build your own music player with Howler.js because there's not much talk about the streaming bit in the article itself. So it's, it's rather um, a tutorial on how to build a music player using Howler.js that would also consume streams, right? So because Howler actually has this uh, feature integrated, you can work on files or you can work on streams and will just work equally fine, right? So there is no talk in the article on how to set up the backend and stream the music from there or anything like this. It's a purely front end thing. Nonetheless, if you were curious on how to build your own music player that was also able to consume streams from radios or whatever, then this will uh, get you started in about 10 minutes. It's very basic. I mean, Howler.js is a really nice library. I have only played around with it just to see how it works. But you know, if I would build a music player right now, I would definitely use it because it's very straightforward and easy to use. But if you're curious, do check this out. Next thing we got here is avoiding nightmares, not safe for work.js. Client site indecent content checking for the soul. Um, <laughs> this, this like, I, okay, you know what? I'm not gonna talk about it. I'm just really uh, confused by people who consider not safe for work things in like nightmares. It, it just sounds weird. All right, everyone watches this stuff and I don't know why is it nightmares. I guess, you know, maybe on work environment that might be nightmares, but in normal, like in your home, whatever. So this article talks about, um, it's it introduces the uh, not safe for work.js framework that allows you to uh, check for porn, hentai and sexy content, which is interesting distinction. There's actually five types that it detects, drawing hentai, neutral, porn and sexy. 
and uh, does it client side. So essentially it uses TensorFlow to load the pre-trained model uh, that allows you to do this checking in just like a few lines of code essentially. As I said, TensorFlow.js here, uh, so you will have to install it and it depends on it essentially. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how good the model is and how much uh, false positives will it detect because, you know, the uh, sort of new detection and porn detection always have been very finicky because it tends to, you know, if you have a photo of someone with a lot of skin and it doesn't even have to be not safe for work, like it doesn't have to be porn, it just have to be like someone in, I don't know, in, in, in trunks, for example, right? There's nothing sexy about that but it might be detected as porn. So I'm kind of curious how that will perform, but I did not have time to uh, check it just yet. So I, I might as well play around with it and see how, how good is it or how bad is it. But nonetheless, you know, if you are, uh, if you want to filter out the user content like this, and this is the typical use case for it, right? If you want to have some family friendly website that allows users to upload images, then this might actually work quite well. It, I mean, it's a really cool project nonetheless. It's just, you know, the phrasing around it is a bit, just rubs me a bit the wrong way because come on, everyone watches porn. Like, what would you do about that? <laughs> it's not a disgusting thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just a thing that you shouldn't do at work, right? That's so like, and yes, there are valid use cases and everything. So if you're curious, do check it out. It is a really nice project. The sources are on GitHub and everything. So um, yeah, it's quite cool. All right, continuing, we got the language server index format from VS Code team. They are introducing another uh, thing to VS Code. I'm just gonna quote this part. The goal of language server index formats, uh, else if, um, uh, as they shorten it, is to support rich code navigation in development tools or a web UI without needing a local copy of the source code. So we already have, um, we already have the interesting sort of uh, experiment, I guess, of the code sandbox, essentially having the full VS code in it, right? With even with the plugins now. It seems like the VS code team itself is aiming to sort of move the VS code or split it into a server bit and UI bit that will be able to deploy um, to web, for example, which is definitely a notion that I really like. And uh, they already have the language uh, server protocol, right? That simplifies the integration of uh, rich code stuff uh, for just about any languages. And now they have this additional language server index format that allows you to, uh, so LSP is the current tech, right? But LSP has a caveat that it requires all your source code files to be on a local disk. While language server index format doesn't have this requirement, which is sort of the next, I guess you could consider it the next version of it, maybe sites pin, I don't know, sure. But it's nonetheless, it's very interesting to see how that will develop and what we will see as a result of that. Um, I am like, I think this would be my dream thing to have VS Code be usable on top of my GitHub repositories or GitLab repositories, maybe even integrated into GitHub. And maybe this is the end game for VS Code team. Like they're not really communicating it that well yet, but at least from the intention of this protocol, it seems like this is what they're aiming for. And I'm absolutely hyped for this. Like this would be, VS Code is owned by GitHub, uh, by Microsoft. GitHub is owned by Microsoft. So if, you, if they put that together, this is like dream stack. Like you could literally just work there. And then, I don't know, <laughs> free deployments to Azure for testing, that would be even better. Uh, if you use it in the front end, what, uh, I mean, come on, you should never trust the front end content, right? So coming back to the discussion on the not safe for work model, obviously you cannot trust the uh, front end to uh, say that this is, you know, you cannot upload this or you can upload this. You have to double check it in the back end anyway. But the thing is that can prevent majority of cases, right? So users who are not very tech savvy, they want to be able to upload anything anyway. So they, this will stop 80% of malicious cases. And then the other 20% you should just validate on the backend. So there you go. All right, continuing, we got React portals with hooks. A tutorial on how to create a use portals hook, essentially, that would allow you to write components that are rendered in portals, which is actually very, very elegant with hooks. And it's a very, very cool use case showing you how to use some of the more, um, 
how do I, I wouldn't call them obscure hooks, but you know, hooks that are rarely used, like use ref, for example, this is not something you see in your typical tutorials. And it's really cool to see it here uh, with, you know, proper cleanup and everything. So if you were thinking about creating a portal component that simplifies using components inside of portals by just essentially doing that, which is really neat. So you wrap it in portal and then you write the normal code in there and it essentially opens it in portal, which is just absolutely awesome. Check it out. This is a very good tutorial. If you already use hooks and you kind of understand how the ref's working and all that kind of stuff, then yeah, there's nothing really amazingly new here. It's a very basic tutorial. Vondible is hosting us. Well, thank you, Vondible, for hosting me. I'm not sure <laughs> how that works out, but you know what? I'm not good with Twitch stuff, so just thank you for hosting me. There we go. All right. Continuing, we got building a React autocomplete component from scratch. This is a basic tutorial on how to write um, autocomplete component in React uh, that is actually kind of good with, you know, using the key for navigating the React, uh, sorry, the autocompleted bits and uh, sort of filtering options and everything. It is... Um, using old classes. So you're not going to be using hooks. If you care about this stuff, you've already know how to build autocomplete and react. Well, there's nothing super new over here, but it's it's a nice tutorial. So if you were wondering how to build react autocomplete thing yourself do check it out. If you already know all of that, well, there's nothing really new here. Next thing we got here is how to get started with internet. I'm going to screw up this word. <laughs> How to get started with internationalization in JavaScript. There we go. Can I just call it Intel from now on? Okay, so just Intel is going to be our uh, alias for it because I cannot for the life of me pronounce that word correctly. So this is a tutorial for official Intel API in JavaScript. And author gets it correct by essentially starting uh, by talking about the support of this API in different browsers. As you can see now, it's actually supported in majority of browsers out there, uh, aside from some obscure ones like Opera Mini, Blackberry browsers, and UC browser for Android, which I honestly have, I, like, I'm not even sure what percentage do they have, but there you go. So it walks you through all the available Intel APIs like daytime format, number format, plural rules, collator, and all the other things related to them shows you how to work with locales, shows you how to work with um, locale ne negotiation, time formatting, and so on and so forth. So basically, everything you need to know about Intel API in JavaScript, pure JavaScript, so it doesn't use any libraries or anything like this. And, you know, formatting dates, plurals, and everything, it is all here, all outlined very nicely, explained very nicely, and ready for you to learn. Um, I would say that I... Like I personally learned stuff like this from MDN docs. And while this does gives you a bit more sort of, a, you know, flow in terms of how it explains all those things, I would say that the MDN docs still have more detailed explanations for some of those. So if you are curious, read this first and then go to MDN docs and read a bit more about it because they do give you more in-depth overview of the API. There we go. Next thing we got here is 12 concepts that will level up your JavaScript skills. Now, you might notice that our uh, BXJS podcast rarely has articles like 12x, 10x, best things, whatever, because I absolutely hate them. Majority of time, this is just a clickbaity bullshit that is not worth your time, right? But this time around, there is actually some... Um, nice collection of concepts that are indeed something that completely changed the way I work with JavaScript or made it better. For example, value versus reference. It took me quite some time to figure out how exactly JavaScript passes the things around, but learning when does the uh, things get passed by reference actually changed a lot how I think about my code and fixed quite a lot of, or rather prevented me from uh, writing code with quite a lot of bugs in them. Uh, closures is a thing that, yeah, it took me, I think, <laughs> took me a couple of years to actually figure out how the hell the closures work in JavaScript properly, you know, to, to like complete extent. But um, I would say that learning how closures work in JavaScript was one of the most important parts of learning the JavaScript itself. But yes, it took me a couple of years to actually nail it down. Okay. I'm not sure if I agree with things like destructing and spread rest, which is pretty common syntax. It will improve your code, but I 
Leveling up, I don't know, like it's just the same, it's just a syntactic sugar, right? So like, yeah, okay, it's useful. Um, the same goes for array methods and all the other stuff is like, yeah, it's just good to know. Generators are really good. I'm not sure I've, I've like honestly, so I've been writing JavaScript codes pretty much daily for the last eight, nine years, I guess. And I have yet to find a use case for generators. It might be just the area of data processing and data science is not really, uh, you know, aligns that good with generators. Or maybe I just swap it for a sync of eight and that's it. But yeah, there you go. Nonetheless, yeah, so it's like other stuff seems very basic. Um, but yeah, if you're just starting with JavaScript, do make sure to read through that. Uh, it will give you a good, at least outline of what you should understand on a very basic level to get a bit better at JavaScript. But yeah, it's, it's decent. At least it's, you know, it's not as clickbaity as all the other articles that do this. <laughs> there you go. All right, next thing we got here is under the hood of Apollo, the article that talks about Apollo.js and looks under the hood specifically on Apollo client side. So the, you know, React, uh, all the components, uh, how do you work with like what the observables do for it? How do you uh, write the code for it? What exactly this code does? How does the caching works? How does the HTTP links works? And so on and so forth. There is some interesting things here. So if you already work with Apollo, you are likely aware of about 80% of them. If you are not working with Apollo, but you are curious about it, make sure to read it. There are some pretty interesting things going on under the hood. I did not know about majority of them because I, you know, I didn't, I don't really have that much experience with Apollo to be honest, but yeah, it is very curious. Uh, if you are not working with Apollo and have no interest with it, then well, you might skip it. All right, next thing we got here is happy little accidents debugging JavaScript. This is, a uh, tutorial on how you can debug your JavaScript. A bunch of ways starting from console log, the way that everyone debugs their JavaScript. And yes, I am uh, guilty of that as well. It does gives you a bunch of neat tricks for console logging. Like this is one of my favorite ones that I use pretty much daily, where you can log the uh, shorthanded objects so that you can actually get the, not just the value of an object, but also the name of a object, property, whatever, string. Um, this is the thing I didn't know exists that you can actually color the output or actually I know that it existed, but I didn't know how to properly do that. And it turns out it's quite easy actually. Uh, it also goes into talk about the other console uh, functions like console table, which is quite useful, but I never use it for some reason. Console trace, which is very nice and allows you to get stack traces from just about everywhere. Uh, console count for counting things and yeah, console group, console de uh, de debugger. Um, yeah, and then it switches to the debugging with um, V8, uh, sorry, the Chrome DevTools debugger specifically showing you how you can uh, do conditional breakpoints, showing you how you can watch values, working with a networking tab, logging and all that kind of stuff. If you already worked with uh, all of these things and understand them, then well, there's nothing really new here. If you are just getting into the debugging world then make sure to check it out, it's a very good summary of basically everything you need to know. There is also a slides for a talk and maybe at some point will be a video. So keep an eye on the author. All right, next thing we got here is performance measurements of JavaScript solutions to common algorithmic questions, part one. So it's a discussion and sort of insight into the, um, whether you have to optimize your common algorithmic solutions. Um, how do I put it? So the author takes the common algorithmic questions like reverse a string and then writes it in a bunch of different ways and measures the impact on performance. Like the reversing a string in, you know, using a for method reversing a string using array split reverse join, and then using chars uh, reverse and join, essentially. It's a slightly more complex um, array uh, thing, basically, right? And then he compares the performance using a sort of basic benchmark. Now, here's the interesting thing. With uh, In the case of string, it actually is faster to do it using arrays, which uh, sounds a bit counterintuitive, right? 
But the thing is that V8 does so many um, optimizations under the hood that it is insane and you never can guess. Now, this is why I think it's important to not try to optimize before, before you actually hit the problem because you might not even have a problem because V8 is so good at optimizing your code. Uh, there's also a bunch of other examples like, for example, finding the longest word. There is uh, three or four different code snippets here um, and yeah, kind of conclusion here. So do check it out if you are interested in optimizations. Uh, and again, as I said, you know, do not optimize before you actually hit the problem. Uh, this is sort of my take on it. You make a podcast on JavaScript. Can you make one on Java? Uh, no, I'm not working enough with Java while I work with it occasionally. Uh, like I, I don't know, once a month, maybe I touch Java projects because we have some of the stuff that is, for example, natural long language processing. There's a lot of projects uh, written in Java like Core NLP but I'm not using it enough. I'm not tracking Java field enough to talk about it. <laughs> um, I mean, I wouldn't mind doing that, but I just don't have enough expertise in the area. You know, I don't feel confident enough to talk about Java. Okay, continuing with the JavaScript podcast, 10 NPM security best practices. This is an article from uh, Snake Guys uh, who are providing the sort of security platform for JavaScript that can audit your dependencies and tell you what is wrong with them. So take it with a grain of salt because they do uh, sort of promote themselves in it, which is not a bad thing. Uh, but uh, yeah, there is sort of security best practices uh, outlined in the article, like avoid publishing secrets to NPM registry. Like if you are doing that, then well, I got bad news for you, you should stop doing that. The good thing is that NPM actually intercepts that and will uh, revoke those tokens now which is kind of good. Uh, yeah, the other stuff like enforcing the log files, ignoring run scripts, uh, assessing NPM projects health with NPM audits, um, auditing vulnerabilities using their platform, for example. Yes, yes. I mean, it's a, it's a good tool, actually. So if you're, you know, worried about the um, vulnerabilities, make sure to check them out. They are quite nice. Use NPM local proxy, uh, which is also okay. Like we had to do this in enterprise uh, company where I worked because there was like regulations about it and stuff. This is, I guess, important if you are afraid that the dependencies on NPM might change, which is, I mean, unlikely because they are locking them now, right? But nonetheless. So if you are worried about your security on NPM, make sure to check this article out um, again. It is from the snake guys. It is a nice platform, but yeah, take it with a grain of salt. It's also free for open source. So you don't really have that much to lose. There you go. All right. Next article we got here is using Node.js 11.7 worker threads with RxJS observable. Uh, had a terrible experience with Verdaccio. I, I haven't actually used Verdaccio. I used its predecessor which was called Synopy, I think, which was okay-ish. Like there also was some problems and we in the end switched to the paid enterprise solutions for that. But, you know, if you have to use it locally, that means you have money. That means you can just buy a stable solution. Like I think we switched to Artifactory, which was working fine. Cannot say anything about Verdaccio. But okay, continuing, we got the article about using worker threads with RxJS Observable. Essentially a tutorial that shows you how you can wrap your worker thread into RxJS to uh, have essentially a nicer interface to it. There is, it's a very basic tutorial. There's nothing really super complex about it, but it's a nice way to, uh, yeah, sort of wrap it to subscribe to it and work to it with over time emitted values, I guess, you know, the, what, what essentially RxJS is good at. Not Verdaccio itself, but the fact that we had a project that used a private repo and a private repo was abandoned in the project. Oh, God, <laughs> this is the worst thing. Yeah, OK, yeah, I know what you mean. This is typically the worst. OK, um, continuing, we got the last article for today, Progressive React. This is a um, checklist with detailed explanations. So we'll start with this TLDR, which is just a checklist itself. But the article itself is pretty long and it's uh, expands on each of those points, telling you how to, you can make your React site more performant, uh, starting from you know using prof Profiler, performance uh, panel in the DevTools, using React Memop, your components, component should update, and a bunch of other existing React tooling. 
Uh, and yeah, there is, as I said, it expands a lot on each of those points, tells you what exactly you can do, how exactly you can make your React app more performant. So if you care about your app performance and if you care about your users, do check it out. It is a very good write-up. All right, that is actually it for the articles for today. Now we got the short things left, uh, the tiny bits of awesomeness. The first one is this back off and retry JavaScript uh, using JavaScript arrays and promises. Talks about executing a bunch of uh, batches of um, things, like in this case, talks about the requests uh, as promises and evading them all. In this specific case, the problem is that the author queries some sort of an endpoint that has a rate limit on it. So the author looks into how you can actually batch things while also having this back off mechanism, as in as soon as you hit that uh, retry limit, right, you should wait a bit and then retry again. So there's a way of doing that. Uh, I mean, obviously using set timeout, it's quite interesting how you can simplify it to essentially a bunch of like, I think it's like 20 lines of code, which is kind of cool. So async await is great, promises are great, and you can use a set timeout to sort of back off and wait a bit when the API tells you there is a problem with it. All right, uh, continuing, we got why I write CSS in JavaScript from Mike, Max Stoiber, who is the uh, maintainer of styled components. And he gives a pretty detailed explanation of how, why he likes writing CSS in JavaScript and why he will never switch back to CSS itself. So if you're evaluating should you use CSS in JavaScript, do check it out. It is a very nice write-up. Have to leave. See you later. Yes, see you later, man. Um, talk on Discord as usual. All right, continuing. We got uh, two announcements for the upcoming rewrite of React DevTools. First of all, they're going to support editable props and state, which you can just, you know, edit in DevTools and change whatever you want. That looks absolutely amazing. And second of all, it's getting an ability to rewrite state hooks, which is even better. So because I, I don't know, I personally write all my things using hooks now because it's just way cleaner. And uh, yeah, um, there you go. All right. Uh, next thing we got here is new RFC for ESLint config file simplification. So they are reworking config file. Uh, look, make sure to check it out. If you're using ESLint, make sure to comment if you have any comments for that. It is a very significant rework, but I personally think it's it's okay. I like guess I'm not sure if I like it completely yet. Because there is yeah, there's a lot of changes here. But I guess unless I will try I won't really know, but I do like the move towards the simplification of it. So make sure to check it out if you're using ESLint, which is, you know, 99% that you probably are. And leave your comments if you have any. All right, next thing we got here is the announcement for Preact JS. So Preact X Alpha or Beta is coming on March 4th. It's a large rewrite of Preact that is going to be smaller, which I still don't understand how they managed to do that. We'll get uh, support for hooks and a bunch of other things. So if you are curious about it, do check out this Twitter thread. There is a lot of very interesting info in there. Next thing we got here is the new upcoming feature for NPM that will allow you to um, interactively update your dependencies. This is finally getting baked into the NPM itself. Up until now, I used NPM uh, check updates. I think it was, was it just NPM check? I always forget it. I think it was just NPM check at the end. Come on, NPM, why are you so slow? Yeah, there we go. It looks almost exactly like this. And this is what I've been using so far, which worked quite nice. But having it baked into the NPM itself is pretty neat. Next thing we got here is uh, Chrome will allow users to see the extensions activity, which is something that uh, I think kind of boggles my mind, right? So we have this Chrome, which is a pretty incredible web platform that you can run a lot of things on, including extensions that can, well, pretty much access just about anything you do on the web, right? And so far, there was no way to control what they actually do and no way to monitor what they do while we have similar capabilities on Android, for example. Now you can finally do that. You can actually see what kind of calls are made, how many and what extensions do them, which is kind of neat for now. It is behind the extension activity logging command flag, but I'm guessing it's going to be released in the next uh, two or three versions of Chrome, which is kind of awesome. Next thing we got here is the new feature added to Chrome Canary. 
You can finally play around with simd in WebAssembly. It's for now it is behind the experimental flag. But the fact that it is landed is kind of awesome. So we are going to get way, 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 well, let me try that again. We're going to get way, way, way faster with WebAssembly once this is released. All right. Next thing we got here is announcing an Ionic React Beta. This is a release of a new version of Ionic Framework that allows you to build uh, UIs using React. Looks quite neat. I, I'm, like, I'm not sure if I would go back to something like Ionic, which is still you know using WebView after using React Native because React Native is just simply way more performant. But if you're using Ionic, that might be a good news for you. So do check it out. Next thing we got here is the news that um, Node.js team are, are considering dropping official support for ARM v6, which is the oldest ARM architecture starting from Node 12 and on. Uh, same decision was made for x86. Um, and yeah, it's it makes sense. But you know, if you are using uh, ARM v6 devices, I guess it's time to upgrade. <laughs> so there you go. All right, now we are to releases. They don't really have that many of them. The first release we got this week around is Node 11.10, which essentially upgrades the LibUV and NPM and adds a bunch of other minor things. Um, not much changes here, really. The uh, next release that is pretty big, actually, we got here is Deno version 0.3. Uh, Deno is the new Node.js, kind of Node.js-like project from Randall, the guy who created the original Node, and he's now sort of reimagining it. Um, this is, yeah, the version 3 release. I think there's, yeah, and there's been some releases, but still way, way, way far away from the production ready, but you can play with it and try it out. It is getting, like, very slowly, but it is getting there. So I'm kind of excited to see how will it look once it's finished? The cool thing I want to note here is that it's actually running on the latest V8, which is um, the thing that I, I wish Node would do. Uh, but you know, apparently for the for the obvious reasons, it's really hard to upgrade Node to the latest V8. While Deno seems to be uh, built around the idea so that it, it is very easy to upgrade it to the latest V8 engine, which is kind of awesome. All right, next release we got here is NPM 6.9 Next. So this is pre-release for the uh, next version of NPM. And I wanted to highlight it because it is getting a time traveling feature uh, for installs. We can use before flag to install dependencies that were published on a specific date. So we can say, I want to try this out for all the devs that were published on, um, I don't know, two weeks ago. Or I want to always install this for dApps that are only installed or only published today. So it's sort of like package locking, but you know, with time travel capabilities, which is interesting. I'm not sure what the use cases would be, but it sounds like a really neat feature. All right, and I think the last release we got here is micro bundle 0.10 and actually 0.10.1 already. I totally forgot that project existed, but it is quite nice. And it now allows you to define environmental variables as well as alias, uh, packages, remap them on build time, for example, from React to Preact and from React DOM to Preact, which is kind of cool. As usual, this is uh, built by Mr. Jason Miller, develop it, uh, who is building Preact itself, for example. So it's a very high quality project. Do check it out. All right, now we are coming to the demos and libraries. First thing we got here today is Vinmine.exe. This is a Windows 95 built using React hooks. Yes, it like majority of it actually works. It is, you have a Minesweeper that you can actually play. And um, <laughs> I, you know what? It's just a silly, interesting project. It's open source and it's built with React hooks. So do check it out. It is quite neat. Next thing we got here is Enigma Simulator, simulator for the Enigma machine uh, built in JavaScript. Um, again, completely interactive. You can check it out and see how it works if you are ever curious. This is a really neat project. Next thing we got here is Cryption in browser AES file encryption with data integrity checks, which is kind of neat. So if you were looking for um, browser-based encryption, uh, so it uses the crypto API as far as I'm uh, aware. I'm not, I think I read somewhere that it did it, but yeah, here you go. I, I mean, AES encryption and browser and with data integrity checks. 
Um, we got Node.js.dev that for some reason is broken now. <laughs> So if you are not aware, Google started um, open the registration of .dev domains, um, I think it was like a few days ago. And they've given out a bunch of domains or, or maybe sold them out to a bunch of uh, public companies like for example, Node.js. And uh, Node.js.dev is a domain that actually just a few hours ago pointed to a very nice introduction to Node.js. I'm not sure why it's broken now, but hopefully they will fix it. It was a very cool tutorial to Node.js that you can just go through and you will basically learn all the basics, but for now it's um, broken, so we'll just skip it. Next thing we got here is file drop component for Google. Let's try this again. File drop component from Google Chrome Labs. Simple file drag and drop custom element. So this is a web component that allows you to drag and drop things. Um, as easy as that. Do check it out if you are looking for something like this. Next thing we got here is isolated VM, a secure and isolated JS environment for Node.js. So at some point, a few podcasts ago, we talked about the Cloudflare workers, which allow you to run code in V8 isolates. Now, I was looking for a way to work with them uh, because you know for right now if you are working from Node, for example, to work with isolates, you should actually write the native extension that accesses the V8 isolate C class and then somehow interact with it, which was a pain in the ass. So I sort of eventually forgot about forgot about that and decided to, you know what, I'll just wait until something easier comes around. Well, there you go. Somebody pointed me out to this library, which essentially exposes the isolates API to Node.js. So you can actually write JavaScript that instantiates and executes uh, isolates or code in isolates. It has a really nice API, I played around with it. It allows you to run them in a very simple way. It had, provides uh, stuff like memory limits, multi-thread support, inspector support, and basically everything you want. It does not have module support by default, so you would have to provide all the modules to isolate yourself. But uh, yeah, it's, it's really neat. Do check it out if you have any use cases for that. Next thing we got here is Cleave.js. Format your input content when you are typing. So you can actually type something at once my credit card. I will not do that, but uh, yeah, it actually doesn't allow you to type anything. So it's uh, kind of neat. There you go. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a pretty cool thing and uh, allows you to format on type, pretty lightweight and seems to be working with just about everything. Do check it out. Next thing we got here is SimpleFS. Handles files on IndexedDB like you would in Node.js. Essentially allows you to store and uh, read files and work with files in browser using IndexedDB. API is very similar to uh, Node.js FS API, aside from the fact that it is actually promise-based, which is uh, way nicer. Cannot wait for promise-based rewrite for Node.js. But there you go. So if you wanted to store files on the client side, you can now do this with this uh, very nice API. Next thing we got here is Bool, a premium queue package for handling jobs and messages in Node.js. We already talked about queues today. This is just another one. Uh, works on Redis as well, has a lot of features, uh, seems very nice. So if you were looking for a queue, do check it out. Next thing we got here is FastCli. Test your download speed and upload speed using fast.com from your command line. Um, another tiny thing from uh, Mr. Sindra Soros, essentially, yes, allows you to just test your speed from command line in a very fast way. You don't even have to install it. You can just do npx fast, right? So, which is uh, pretty nice. Next thing we got here is Navi, a declarative synchronous routing for React. Uh, seems to be an alternative for uh, React router or reach router or whatever. The core proposition is that it basically has the asynchronous uh, baked in a, a synchronicity baked in looks nice. I, I like, I don't know. I personally, uh, personally, majority of time I use Next.js with next router, which is entirely different from all of that, but maybe you needed something like that. Do check it out. Next thing we got here is hundred days of code front end curriculum for learning front end development during hard, uh, hard days of code. No hundred days of code. So this is essentially um, outline of how you can learn all the front end development in just hundred days. I, I'm very skeptical about it. I mean, it's a very nice curriculum and it does outline basically everything you need to know to learn front end development, but you can 
get the basics, I guess, in 100 days. Like you can understand the basics of all of that's written here in 100 days, but learn all of that. Yeah, you can get started. Let's just call it you can get started in 100 days. Okay, that's, that's, that's a fair assumption. All right. Um, last demo we got here for today is the World Wide Web browser. This is the first browser that was built for the internet uh, in, uh, I don't even remember, what was the year, like 1980 something? And the guys from CERN actually rebuilt it using web technologies. So you can actually now try and uh, play around with it on the web. And yes, all of it works. There is even some, um, some things, what was it? There is Comsys announced, no wait. One of this was working if I remember correctly. So they even copied, there you go. I think there was, yeah, there was some of the old things that are actually working, which is kind of awesome. So if you're curious how the internet browser looked when it was just released, do check it out. It is a very cool project and sort of preservation project. And uh, yeah, it is quite fascinating how hard it is to navigate the damn thing. <laughs> there you go. That is actually it for demos and libraries. Now we come to some uh, other interesting and curious and uh, funny things. The first thing I want to point out is that GitLab is dying. Some th uh, um, GitLab is doing something very weird. So there's this face swap rep repo from Deepfakes. Uh, that allows you to swap the faces in videos, pictures, and so on and so forth. And it's actually not accessible unless you are logged in. And they didn't change any settings. So if you like open a new window and you are not logged in, for example, in, it won't let you access the code, which is very, very strange from the GitHub side. You know, it's it's a bit of a bullshit. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's just keep an eye on that. Uh, the next thing we got here is Google partially backtracks on Chrome changes that would break ad blockers. They are still not canceling their plan to uh, guts the extensions. They are just extending the capabilities of Manifest with 3 to account for some of the things that the blocking extensions wanted. I mean, it's getting better, but it's still kind of bullshit. If Google goes through with these changes, I unfortunately will have to switch to Firefox, for example, because I do like my uBlock origin and uMetrics. I cannot live without them. All right. Next thing we got here is the uh, fact that um, Node.js was first version of Node.js, or I guess first commit of Node.js was started 10 years ago uh, on February 16, uh, which I picked up Node.js, I think a year after it was released. So I have nine years of Node.js experience, which is to be honest, terrifying. <laughs> but there you go, that's the thing. Right, and my favorite thing in software development this week was this article called Explaining Code Using ASCII Art. So this, this article so, um, sort of aggregates all the explanations of different algorithms inside of the code on GitHub that is done using ASCII Art, which is absolutely awesome. This is like one of, look at these diagrams. They are so freaking complex. This is literally my favorite things. Like, I cannot imagine how long the people who did that spent on writing this bloody ASCII art. But this is, this is pretty great. This is like, this is awesome. And whenever I will be writing an algorithms that would require something as complex for explanation, I think instead of writing comments, I would actually do that because this looks great. This is my new favorite thing, basically. All right, um, that is it from my side, actually. This was BXS Weekly episode 51. As usual, you can find all the links mentioned on GitHub. If you have any links you want to share with me, do feel free to send them into the chat. Uh, join our Discord, share it with me on Twitter, share it with me on Twitch, whatever. Um, yeah, this is basically all I have for you for today. If you guys, uh, I'm just keeping screwing it up. If you have any questions, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. If not, we can just wrap this up here. And uh, if you have any questions post factum, again, feel free to join our Discord server and ask them there. If you need any help with JavaScript, join as well. We are more than happy to help you. Um, yeah, that is basically it from my side. It doesn't seem like there's any questions from the chat side. So thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. I hope you um, have a nice weekend and a cool rest of the week. And I see you next time. Bye.